first presentation. Our first presenter is Scott Bash. Scott is the president of FCS Group in Redmond, Washington. He has more than 30 years of strategy, technology, and organizational management experience. Scott's presentation today is on aligning people, process, and technology to maximize the performance and integrity of assets. Take it away, Scott. Thank you very much, David. So just to kick things off here, what I really want to talk about is uh, how we set systems up so they can be utilized effectively by the people who use the data. I think every one of us has had experience of using IT systems that don't go the way we thought they were going to go. Uh, they don't have the functions and features that we like, or we run a report and the data that we want is not there. And a lot of that is having to do with the way the system was designed, uh, the way it was implemented, or the way it was configured. And sometimes as an IT professional, what we would do is uh, design the system, and then the users say it doesn't work. And then we as uh, IT designers says, well, that's the way we designed it. And so a lot of what we need to talk about is the way at which we do this alignment. So the diagram that we're looking at now is just a, a, a model of, of how we would go about designing information systems and more particularly looking at the requirements of those systems. We start off by identifying what are the strategic goals. Why are we having this system to begin with, like a customer information system or an asset management system such as a maintenance management system? Once we understand what the strategic goals are, then we can understand what the functions are needed from that system. Then we drill down into the business processes that are necessary to meet that strategic goal. So if it's a maintenance management system, it is the work order process or the condition assessment process or the reliability analysis process. And those business processes help design the information system so that the process works to meet the goals. But the final criteria in designing this in terms of alignment is it's all about the people. Uh, ultimately, what happens is that people use the information systems in a process to meet the strategic objectives. So this is where the alignment really starts. When we talk about asset management and looking at the IT part of asset management, there's several different types of data that we want. We want to have information about how well the system is performing and that's reliability or the assets within those systems and their reliability. We want history about the asset. When was it installed? How much did it cost? What's the serial number? What's the manufacturer type? We also like to have data about the maintenance of that. And I think when you combine that with history, it's not just the maintenance data itself, like when did we have a defect, but what was the mean time between those defects where the information that starts to be applied and gaining knowledge about those assets. And then condition assessment and condition monitoring data, and then uh, performance metrics. So there is a whole host of other types of data sorts, but uh, these are the ones that really become critical for asset management. So the value of the knowledge that's within those asset management systems is, is really about analyzing and monitoring and de developing uh, an understanding about the reliability of the assets. It's about regulatory reporting. It's about measuring and managing performance, and it's about doing some level of forecasting. And in the other speakers, we're going to talk a little bit more and show some examples of, of how that data is used by people. And I think the other thing that's, that's really important is the access of data. And what's happening with technology today is there are more and more ways at which people have the ability to access that information. Everyone here obviously is on some sort of a communication device and probably on, on, a, on a computer or looking at a projection of, of a computer and we're accessing information. So as I'm speaking, you're hearing me. As I'm showing you images, you're seeing those or, or being able to visualize something. And the way we can use the power of human viewing speed to be able to access information is, is also a way for us to be able to communicate and share that, that knowledge. So sometimes we like, like to see things in spreadsheets, but sometimes we like to see things in graph. It depends on what the data is being used for. I think the other thing that's real important is uh, what's referred to as the Internet of, Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. If you haven't heard about it, uh, you should be aware. It is coming and coming strong. Uh, some estimates are that by the year 2020, which is not too far away, there will be 30 billion connected devices. 
This is anything from a smart home, like an automatic thermometer or self-driving self cars uh, or different types of lights that come on uh, when you uh, are, are just coming home from, from, from work or, or what have you. And the other thing that's key on this is that what's, what's occurring is that these different devices now are getting much, much smaller. Uh, this, this is a blown up image of a device that's a little bit smaller than, say, uh, the, the bar of soap you might see in a hotel room. Uh, and what's happening is that manufacturers, like pump manufacturers, uh, devices like blowers and motors and things like that, are embedding this type of a platform in their equipment. So the pumps of the future will have vibration sensors and different types of pressure transducers and little computers that are built into the housing. And then through wireless connections, they'll be able to connect up to uh, all sorts of different types of, of infrastructure. And so what we see in terms of the design uh, and the way information is being used is it's going to be attached. It's going to be wearable. It's going to be embedded. It's going to have all sorts of software needs. There's going to have to be people to support this. And uh, what we think of as the traditional, say, maintenance worker of, of yesteryear is going to have a new skill set uh, to be able to uh, access, to manage, and to be able to interpret this information in a near real-time uh, fashion. So what I want to jump into now is talking about how do you go about setting something like this up? How do you think about the, the alignment? And I'm going to start with just a very simple stick diagram. This is a little stick guy uh, who is performing work. Uh, maybe they're doing a work order. Uh, and, and I could replace this performer with an asset, and, and, the, and the same logic diagram is, is true. So we have input to this performer. We have output that the performer produces something. And when we're looking about designing information systems and having these all align, the first thing we want to do is what is the requirement of the output? What are we trying to achieve? Once we understand what the goal is of that performer's output, then we start saying what is required as an input. What sort of forms do they need? What sort of knowledge do they need? What sort of data would they need? Once we understand this, then we start saying, OK, what's the consequence of not meeting the performance output? What's the consequence of not having the right data input? And consequences could be expressed as something that's good, or it could be expressed as something that's bad. Well, I think human nature is that we tend to focus more on the negative things, which leads to the feedback loop. So what we want to be able to do is feed that information or the, the value of that output that that person is performing in some way or another. In other words, I did something, I did it well, I get a cookie. Uh, I did something, I didn't do it up to the standard, and I get a slap on the hand. That would be an example of feedback. But the question is, is how do you design an information system to provide that feedback? And that relates back to the final two points of what we look for in designing and aligning information systems. It is the skills and knowledge of the person performing the job as well as their individual capacity. So we could give somebody all that they need to be able to perform the work, but if they don't have the skills and knowledge to be able to do that, and they don't have the capacity, in other words, they're overloaded, then the overall process and system's not going to work. So when we look at this in a big combination, we create these things called business uh, maps, uh, business flow diagrams, business process models. And some of these processes can be very, very complicated. Uh, and some processes are, are very, very critical. But regardless, when we're designing this, we need to break it down into simple things. We need to define what is the, the task that people perform. Step one, followed by two, three, and four. And then we start to look at those more complicated where we have different users performing those tasks, where I hand something off to someone else who hands it off to someone else, and then it then ends up coming back to me. And then progressively, we look at ways that we use information systems. Maybe it's a paper file. Maybe it's a database in some form or another. And then we have to look at the relationship between this process and the way that we're organized, this process and the way we organize all of our information systems at an enterprise level. So as you can imagine, when you start putting all these things together and you're building these models, you start to identify some problems, and then you develop some opportunities. So we might zero in on an opportunity to improve a particular process. An example of this would be to take one set of this and automate it. It was something that was done manually. We now use information systems to perform. Uh, 
So by doing it in a business process modeling way, we can sort of test it in a virtual world before applying it in the real world. So when you go about a project, uh, what you tend to do is to come up with some specifications to be able to, to uh, identify what you're going to be doing with the system. We typically think of this in three phases. We do the business review. This is where we do the business process analysis and think about the strategy and aligning these things. Then we would procure the system based on the requirements and specifications that we had gotten from phase one. And then we implement it and then test against phase one requirements to see whether or not it's implemented the way we wanted it to. Therefore, the configuration puts us into alignment. So when we talk about specifications, what we do is we document this. We could have as many as 3,000 requirements for a maintenance management system or maybe 100 requirements for a project management system. And then we send this to the vendors. We have them test their system against this, and we choose the vendor that matches up more closely. Uh, we ha give it to the systems integrator, and as they're integrating information, they use this to manage and test uh, the configuration against those requirements. So a big part of all of this is about defining the output. So starting off with the reports is something that very few of us do when we put in information systems. Uh, most cases what we do is implement it, train people on it, roll it out, and then develop the reports. And that's actually backwards. We should always start with the output first. The other thing that we need to be aware of, and, and I think Alden has, and Dave are going to talk about this, is the way we can use information from different systems and then how we bring that into, say, a business intelligence tool. Uh, being able to use business intelligence means that we can use analytical tools to drive in, drill down in, and, and, and make a different uh, story out of the information we have from all these different systems. And I think most people are aware of something which is called the SaaS solution, which is the uh, cloud computing. This is a software as a service, and that's where somebody else might host the data, and then you're grabbing access to this data by way of a web browser or some other type of tool. So what we are doing now, which is sort of kicking off about the uh, entry level to data collection and how we uh, align this with the different uh, needs that we have of users, tying this back to the strategy, tying this back to the business processes, because ultimately what, uh, what we're trying to do with these IT systems is really help people to, uh, to create success. Uh, the way we think of this from the Zen of consulting is solving problems, ending suffering, and providing endless joy. So with that, I'm going to uh, pass it back to David, and uh, we've got a few minutes for some questions if you, if you have any of those right now. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, if you do have questions, uh, please type the questions uh, into the question box on the side panel of the GoToWebinar screen, and I will be able to see those. Um, and ask them directly to the presenters. Um, so we have a few questions, which is awesome. Um, one of the uh, one of the main questions I'm seeing is about kind of getting a better handle on the list of options that are available. So there's a lot of IT solutions out there. How do you how do you narrow down that list, or how do you kind of take a big list and get to a slightly smaller list um, uh, to help you make a decision? A lot of it, from, I, I would say, is about gathering the requirements. So when we think about uh, different IT systems, they provide different functions. Um, and in some cases, how do I know uh, what I want until I know what's available? Um, and at, sometimes you can do that uh, by going to, uh, say, a trade show and walking around and seeing what some of the different functions are. Other cases, you could uh, you know, hire somebody with some expertise who's, who's been around the block for a little bit. But the, the key thing, inevitably, through most people's procurement process is that you're going to be able to have to set some sort of an RFP, RFI. Uh, and that's where setting up the requirements. Uh, when you produce the requirements, wrap an RFP or an RFI around it, you send it onto the market. What you're basically doing is setting up questions, and you're getting the vendors to fill out, and they're very used to this, filling out their response to those questions, and then you do this little simple scoring. You're not necessarily choosing the vendor based on the score, but you're eliminating vendors who don't meet up with your requirements. So that's one way of, 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 of reaching that goal. Great. Uh, um, 
separate question uh, has to do with reporting. Uh, so if you're a utility that already has a report, uh, but <laughs> people don't seem to uh, use the information that is provided, what has worked uh, from your experience in uh, getting people to uh, use the reports and use the data and make decisions off them? The beauty of doing the business process review is not necessarily that you get a diagram that shows how task and flow of data goes from one place to the next. The beauty of the business process review is really when you get the users to sit down and they see how the data flows through. Uh, it's what I call the aha moment. If, uh, For example, let's take a, talk about a timekeeping system. If I fill out a timesheet and I give it to my supervisor who approves it, that's usually the last I hear about it. That supervisor is taking time data sheets from other people and they're passing it on to someone else who's probably typing that into some sort of a, of a HR system and recording the time. When I see how that data is used to either do my paycheck or to be able to track where project uh, costs are or operating costs, it has a different level of appreciation for me as to why my data input's important. And I think when we see this thing where people will take their data and keep it in their spreadsheet or they uh, just don't enter it in to begin with, they probably just don't understand the big picture. And oftentimes what we got to do is I got to go back and show them what they do, the importance of their role in the context of why we do this, why the process is important, what the goal, goal is, and, and more importantly is going back to the individual and recognizing that they have a purpose and a role and to appreciate the role and purpose that they have and let them know that they're that, that what they're putting in has value. Oftentimes though we see a situation where we put lots of data in and we never get any feedback and therefore we say why don't I just stop putting it in or I don't get the information out of the system so I'm going to create my own little spreadsheet or database off on the side and that's because the system wasn't configured right because we didn't think about what the reports were and we didn't think about how the process was going to be used in, 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 in the aggregate. Thanks, Scott. Uh, that was really informative. Uh, that's about all the time we have uh, for uh, Scott's presentation. So we're going to move to the uh, second poll question now. Uh, the second poll question is, uh, please describe the organization you or your group currently work for. We'll provide a few seconds to give you some time to answer that question. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, majority of you uh, coming uh, from utility today, a few consultants and a few of the other category. Uh, our next presentation is with Dave Jurgens and Alden Wyma from the King County Wastewater Treatment Division. Uh, Dave Jurgens is a reliability engineer for King County Wastewater Treatment Division and is a certified maintenance reliability professional with over 30 years of operations and maintenance experience. Alden Wyma is the King County Wastewater Treatment Division asset manager and a certified maintenance and reliability professional with over 25 years of extensive practical experience in Lean Six Sigma reliability operations and maintenance management. Alden and Dave will be reviewing King County Wastewater Treatment Division's transition into a reliability-based maintenance program, so uh, take it away. Well, thanks, David. Um, I appreciate, uh, Scott, the first presentation. Uh, very informative. I, uh, I learned something, too. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, go ahead and just start off by saying that uh, with 12 minutes and, uh, and five minutes of questions, um, I, I don't think I can hope to impart all of the uh, complexities that, uh, that I'd like to, but I'd like to go ahead and use this as a good opportunity for a real-world historical perspective on a journey that uh, King County Waste Treatment has gone through over the last uh, eight years that I've been involved. Um, Scott mentioned that uh, you know the metrics uh, in response to the question uh, regarding data and how do you get people enrolled in it. Um, and it really hit the nail on the head. It's, 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 you know, we want to talk about laying the foundation and making sure that uh, you're, you're, you're leaving no stone unturned. Uh, the, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, metrics, uh, if, if you can't get an honest and sober look at your process and how efficient your process is running, 
uh, then there is very, very little hope that you're going to be able to improve on that process. Uh, so I've kind of broken this into to kind of in the similar in the similar uh, mindset here, looking at the foundation of how we laid laid it for our current state, uh, as well as uh, painting the real picture of what's happening out there, uh, and getting uh, true unbiased uh, data coming in, uh, and then uh, and then hopefully uh, the system cooperates. I'll be able to show some actual live metrics of where we're at right now. And uh, give everybody a, uh, a kind of a purview of, uh, of where we're hoping to go here in the next uh, in the next uh, uh, year or two. Uh, so the big things that we noticed when we were working through this was in laying the foundation, we really had to make sure that our stakeholders were rolled in. Management, uh, unquestionably, being the largest stakeholder in this, and uh, from experience, management um, oftentimes when you're starting uh, to use data in your decisions. Uh, they really don't have a real good idea <laughs> of, uh, of what they want to see. And, uh, and so a manager that's not used to seeing data on a day-to-day -day basis or, or coming up to a dashboard as the first screen on their computer when they come to work, uh, if you come up to them as a reliability engineer and say, you know, what data do you want? Uh, chances are they're going to think real long and hard, but they're going to have a hard time answering that question. So uh, in order to get that kicked off, typically, uh, the biggest recommendation I can give everyone is, uh, is, is what we do is we concentrated on two or three really good solid metrics and being able to, and to, and, uh, to be able to display them, to be able to stand by them, to be able to have a solid line of quality assurance behind those metrics. In other words, a drill down that would allow even, the, uh, even any user that's looking at the metrics to be able to see what the core data sets are made out of. Uh, the other thing we looked at was uh, the user groups, okay, making sure that we could roll them into the process. And, and by being able to define specific user groups, so for example, our operators uh, are using a distributed control system or SCADA, uh, we wanted to form your, your, your power users there. Uh, your computerized maintenance management system, who are your power users for that group? Uh, your process folks, uh, you know, who are your power, power users when it comes to uh, analyzing the uh, process logs and reporting? And, uh, and then finally, your IT folks, uh, you know, who is, who is going to be someone that's going to take ownership on the systems and the communication of, uh, and the integration of those systems? Uh, and so that was, you know, but like I said, the, the, biggest, the, the, the biggest user group was the management team. And the managers really have to drive this uh, because it's a new concept. And we deal a lot, especially in the utility industry, with a culture uh, that, is, uh, that tends to be fairly firm, especially in wastewater treatment. Uh, there's a lot of folks here uh, that have been working you know, 20, 30, even 40 years in this business. And being able to say, OK, you know, we're going to be changing the process so that we can gather data on what you're doing being able to show how that is going to be an advantage to them and to get that buy-in, uh, it typically takes management to do that. Um, the second thing laying the foundation was really agreeing on the terms. So we use systems every day. I use systems when I drive to work in my car, although I may not know it. I'm looking at it's looking at my, uh, you know, my pressure in my tires. Uh, it's looking at my odometer, uh, my speed. Uh, and just like uh, just like on my vehicle every morning, uh, our systems at work uh, uh, we use them uh, day in and out, day out, and we're we're actually accumulating data, uh, and we may not even realize that we're accumulating that data. Um, most folks in the industry will say, you know, it's not about the data, the, the amount of data you have, but it's the quality of the data and how well you can extract that data in order to paint the true picture or to make an apples to apples comparison. On an enterprise, uh, on an enterprise uh, architecture, and so when we started this process, uh, we had to go through a major uh, effort to standardize and normalize the data that we had in the system. And our CMMS, just our computerized maintenance management system, has 130 unique and distinct tables of data, codes, uh, and uh, descriptions. And being able to normalize that uh, such that uh, you could have a, uh, basically each of your plants using the same system, using the same definitions of, uh, of a work type or a work classification uh, or even an incident event that we have or a reportable event, 
all of that had to get uh, had to get streamlined in the system so that we could be able uh, to make a very very succinct and accurate data poll to drive those metrics that uh, that we were going to be publishing uh, to uh, throughout the organization and beyond. Um, we also and and a lot of that started with getting into the process and uh, and so Scott showed some. Uh, a, a process map, and that's real similar to uh, to what we use, kind of a swim lane diagram, and looked at the uh, the processes that we're gonna that we were gonna actually be driving the first few metrics uh, that we're gonna be showing managers, and saying, okay, we really need to get this down uh, to the point where uh, the same individual in, in, uh, at each plant is doing the same, is having uh, basically the same touch points uh, in the system. Uh, and operating under the same, uh, basically the same guidance, in order to make sure that our that our processes were uh, aligned. And then finally, we had to do a lot of house cleaning. Um, and uh, as some of you may know out there when you're talking about asset numbers or equipment numbers, uh, or how items appear on CAD diagrams. Uh, there's a there's a lot of a lot of emotion involved, a lot of attachment to that. Uh, and being able to clean house of some of that old data that's not going to that 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 is that is cluttering of the system uh, takes getting those those folks together and being able to really make a solid case for uh, why we need to do this uh, why we need to change some of our naming conventions or some of our asset naming conventions um, and then uh, and then finally concentrating on the basics. Um, your users have to be trained to use the system the same way. It takes a lot of time. Uh, you bring in folks uh, into uh, into a training environment, uh, being able to interact with your, uh, you know, whether you're working with Hawk Wims or a computer maintenance management system uh, or a DCS system, uh, so that they're using it in the same way and being able to have uh, constraints in the system that's going to minimize the potential uh, for basically. Uh, 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 Denormalizing the, the data, uh, so we love drop downs. You know, we love to make it very, very easy for someone to be able to select the right answer without having to type type it in, uh, and we do that where, wherever is necessary. And uh, and I mentioned spoon feeding in, the, in this last uh, last uh, part of the slide, and, and and a lot of that really comes down to uh, you want to be able to uh, you don't want to inundate your users with a lot of reliability. Uh, uh, so to speak, uh, lingo uh, or trademark names. Uh, this is efficiency, and really, uh, it really boils down to being able to communicate with your users uh, in a way that they're going to understand exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it, uh, and how this is going to help them. So, just a few slides here that shows you know the swim. This is one of our swim lanes. Every process that we have, whether it's material ordering, payroll entry. Uh, in work or work request requisition uh, to work order closure is a documented process, and we make that very uh, open to all users uh, via SharePoint, so that they can go in and they can look at each of our processes if they need to know who is doing what in the system. Uh, it does a lot of things. It defines not only where things are going and how they're being run, and, and so that you can identify, uh, you know, any sort of bottlenecks that are occurring. Uh, but it also uh, it also goes ahead and gives you uh, if you're doing something that you've never done before uh, that you can go in and you can you can refer on okay who do I need to turn this into uh, or where do I need to send this um, I like to use the anomaly that we all won the lottery and went to Tahiti tomorrow uh, that we could bring a new group of folks in and we gave them the resource documentation they could be able to run the system. And that is that's really the uh, that's, that's that's really what we're after in the reliability world. Um, asset group codes you can see on the lower left hand slide. Uh, this is just an example of one of our tables that we go through to be able to uh, be able to uh, uh, name and normalize all of our naming of our assets in a way that we can be able to uh, extract that data very very clearly. Uh, we also use an extensive hierarchy system so that uh, assets. Uh, we can see from the process level, not the location level, but the process level, how each asset relies on, on the other assets, uh, the parent assets, in order to contribute to the process. And this is from uh, not only a reliability standpoint, but it makes it very, very easy for your seasoned users, the ones that may resist uh, uh, 
uh, doing a whole lot of uh, SQL query searches to find something uh, where they can visually go in. If I've been operating the plant for 30 years, I know everything that's in solids. And if I can find uh, that asset uh, visually uh, by going through a, a hierarchy, it makes it very easy for me to uh, uh, for me to locate that asset to write a work request or a work order. And this slide here gives you kind of a brief overview of where we've grown. Um, this shows kind of an interconnection of all of our systems. Uh, we run several interfaces, uh, stuff that Scott does probably quite a bit of, uh, in getting systems to talk to each other. Uh, the biggest challenge that uh, we've had regarding uh, IT integration has been an aging CMS system that we use, uh, which uh, typically uh, deals with uh, flat file transfers. Uh, and uh, and not the latest plugins that you find on a Maximo system these days. Uh, so that's a challenge, uh, but we can make it work. And, uh, and and a lot of workarounds, a lot of interfaces, uh, but uh, but it really is designed to uh, for the system to run together. And it has to be run together in such a way uh, that we're able to consistently feed uh, our metrics. Uh, because once your metrics get established. Management becomes very highly reliant on them. <laughs> so uh, you definitely want to make sure you have a, a high level of, of reliability in, in uh, how your systems are interconnected. Uh, so painting the real picture, uh, knowing your audience. Um, you know, as, a, as, a, as an engineer, and uh, we, we, I tend to be involved to trying to uh, uh, display the data in, uh, in my term terms, and it's not. Uh, you really have to display the data with the users in mind uh, so that they're going to be able to interact uh, with the system uh, in a way that they're, they're used to calling, uh, you know, calling a, certain, a certain piece of equipment by a specific name. Uh, it can be as easy as, a, uh, as, a, as being able to, uh, you know, is it, is, it a, uh, is it a fan or a blower? Well, you want to call it a blower? We'll call it a blower just for you. And so, uh, there's a uh, so there, you really have to uh, dial this into the users. Um, once again, you want to make sure that you can display how your metrics are going to help them, not you. And in the beginning stages of, of bringing this online, uh, we do quite a bit of work in order to show uh, the uh, the users where their data is coming. When they update a work order, how is that coming back to them? And uh, and then finally, uh, you know, the more the users understand, the more they're going to drive the development. And once management got a taste of uh, just a few of the basics, uh, you know, maintenance attainment, overtime, uh, what types of flavor of time are people taking on their on their work orders? Uh, then they get very interested, and it, and then, then the system can drive itself. Uh, keeping it keeping it simple. Spider graphs look cool, but you know, um, and uh, as as engineers, we can fall into the to the realm of trying to get the latest and greatest way to display that data, uh, but if your users don't understand it, uh, you might as well be uh, you might as well be uh, speaking in uh, Russian. Um, you want to make sure drill downs are in the metrics and start with only three or four. Bait the hook, basically. Um, the other big takeaway on this is to spread the word. Make sure your metrics are displayed in common areas, uh, and so we put in several. Uh, several uh, flat panel displays in the common areas in the uh, in the atriums or the uh, uh, the, the entryways to our uh, to our plants uh, and hallways and maintenance break rooms uh, so that uh, uh, you know hot links on the on on the desktop for the computers. Um, we want to make sure uh, we brief the uh, uh, brief the core groups on the metrics uh, regularly. So. Uh, once a week, management uh, gets together with the supervisors and the leads and goes over some of those metrics uh, that are really uh, integral to their group. Um, we've incorporated a lot into the standards and workflows as well. Um, if you, you, know, you have to document what you're doing, um, bottom line. Uh, we also want to um, you know, basically be ready to tweak it. Um, as much time as we spend into developing the metrics, there are always going to be tweaks. Um, if the manager does not want to say, want, does not want, want to see the word failure in a metric, then we remove that word failure with and put something else in its place. Uh, so there's, a, there's always going to be a tweak. And then, uh, and then leverage your technologies. Uh, you know, as Scott alluded to, we're we're in a world where where billions of of, uh, of mobile devices are consistently being connected, 
and their interface is, is much more uh, robust uh, and stable than, uh, and they're always becoming more stable. <coughs> and so this is uh, this has been a uh, it's uh, it's one of those things where uh, you always have to keep your keep your eyes on the horizons for what's coming up next. Hey Dave, um, I hate to cut you off, but we are almost out of time. So uh, I wasn't sure if you wanted to share some of your graphs in the last uh, moment or two, but we may have to cut over to the next presenter. Not a problem. I appreciate it. So uh, this is sort of, sort of our current state, basically, and these are these are some of our electricity usage that's coming in from our uh, from our DCS system through Hawk Wims as well. Uh, biogas production, city water, energy usage by plant areas, and these are constantly being updated on a rolling uh, rolling screen on the front uh, on the on the uh, through our monitors. Uh, and this is uh, this is some of our matrix maintenance metrics. So we've got a schedule attainment, break and work. Each one of these metrics can be drilled down by any user. So if I'm a user, I say, you know, I don't think we had that kind of break and work this week. When they're when they're actually on online, they can click on this from their from whatever terminal they want and see those work orders that this the, the metric is counting as a break and break and work item. Uh, one thing where uh, uh, our plants are being compared side by side. This is an enterprise level metric, and in order to be able to make an apples to apples comparison, uh, we have to we have to be able to have the same processes driving it in each plant. Uh, we also use it for project input. So bad actors report. If I were, we're looking at doing a screenings project in one of our areas, I can say, well, we're having a, the biggest issue with this specific asset right here, and the actual costs for whatever time window we want to set against these other assets. So bad actor reporting. And that's it in a nutshell. So any Dave and Alden, thank you. So much. That was um, incredible. We do not have time for um, questions, but if we have some time at the very end, I um, we did receive a few questions that we will try to get into. So we have a little bit of buffer time at the end to hopefully get to those. But we'll have to jump to our third poll question now. Um, the third poll question is. How many years have you been working on utility data collection and asset management? Thank you very much for your responses. We have um, some great experience in the crowd. Uh, I'm sure we can learn all, something from all of you as well. Going to our third uh, presenter, Mike June. Mike is the GIS manager for the city of Beaverton, Oregon. He has 17 years of work experience in GIS with local government, serving in a variety of roles from project management and business development to GIS analyst. And Mike will be discussing the evolutionary process of using utility data to make decisions through the history of CMMS in Beaverton, Oregon. Uh, Mike, take it away. Thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike John, uh, GIS manager at the city of the Beaverton. I've been in the GIS industry about the 17 years uh, and then about four years in the asset management system since I implemented uh, city work as asset management system for the city here in the Beaverton. Um, today, um, um, I'd like to share my experience while I have implemented the asset management system for the city and the agenda for um, today that I'm going to talk about the uh, Beaverton Asset Management System and obstacles that I have uh, ran into and the changes we made and then the three different types of visualizations. And then uh, uh, finally, I will uh, do a demo, a tool to assist decision making. So Beaverton GIS form, um, we made an executive decision to implement city work as our asset management system in in-house in 2012. We started it to implement it sign shop first uh, because we thought that the, uh, it would be uh, easy to deal with because it's the only point asset. However, uh, we actually failed to implement it as sign shop due to uh, incomplete asset inventory and a lack of resources. In 2014, we uh, finally completed city work for the entire uh, public work department. 
um, this year, uh, fleet divisions uh, purchased their own fleet management software, and then we completed implementation a few months ago. And as I um, implemented the asset management system throughout the city, uh, there's a four major obstacles that I ran into. Uh, first one, uh, it is very difficult to implement a GIS-centric uh, asset management system when we don't have completed uh, asset inventory. Second, um, there's a um, no streamlined business process even among, uh, among steps in the same groups. There's no standard procedures and no, no written documentations and at all. And the third one, there's a, uh, there are uh, many silo databases uh, such as Excel, Access, and the built notes. And this information was not shared um, among groups. And no one knows who got the latest information. The last one, uh, um, last obstacle that, uh, that I have run into is uh, our previous public work director wasn't supportive for technology and GIS and asset management system, which made me very hard to implement it as a management system throughout the city. Uh, next couple of slides, I'd like to talk about the uh, changes we made while um, I was implementing asset management system. Uh, one, of, one of the biggest changes we made is to have one single database in GIS and then got rid of all silo database such as Excel, Access, Sticky Notes, and Tribal Knowledge, so that everything is transparent and then uh, uh, maintain only one data source. I have a um, great story why this is important to have a one database. Um, we had an um, arborist who was supervisor, and then um, he all of a sudden decided to quit the city. And, and then uh, um, he left the city with all his knowledge, and then uh, step uh, left behind, have no clue where to go to prune the tree or trim the trees. So um, there's no work uh, history and no asset inventory um, in this shop. So this is a great uh, reason to have asset management system in place. Um, next biggest changes we made in terms of data integrity is to create you know, implement an as go drawing submission process. As you know, uh, GIS is not a uh, data provider, but a data presenter. And GIS data is totally depending on ESCO drawing when construction is completed. However, um, our city engineers are not good at uh, turning in these drawings in timely manner and sometimes lose their drawings or take several years to complete it. Uh, several years to complete it. Now, um, uh, we made in a web form. So um, I can show uh, the web form that we designed here to see. So these are um, as built submission web form, and then uh, engineers and whoever um, responding engineers, and they finish up work on their uh, as built drawing, or any site developer engineer who received uh, as built drawing from a private consulting company. They're supposed to t uh, type in uh, their as built name, project name, and the types of projects and stuff like that, they fill it in, and then they uh, submit this form to us, and then we, as soon as we receive, receive this as well drawing, we'll update it right away. And then um, this uh, updated utility information uh, shared among our apps and uh, maps throughout the city. So, and also we can uh, search um, as well site by its name or by its Like this, and you can search by date, search by quarter section, search by project numbers, and all kinds of different ways to search as well drawing. And so, uh, and also we're making a hyperlink on our online app so staff can easily access to these drawings. Let's see. So, um, it is really uh, fortunate that we um, we have a new public work director on board not long ago who understand the value of asset management system and not hesitate to adopt the uh, adopting uh, new technologies. It is much easier to implement an asset management system when we have a top down support. Now we have uh, many different types of uh, implementation stage. 
uh, as you see in the uh, changing curve chart, some divisions are in uh, integration mode, and some are still in a resistant mode, and some are uh, searching and understanding uh, under understanding mode. We do have a one division that are really into asset management system, and at their level of usage is advanced. That would help others to start searching and searching functionality that asset management system could do for them and understanding the value. As you see, it's like we're tracking their uh, time entry for our asset management system. And the uh, top, top here, there's no one using it at all. And versus here in the bottom, it's like uh, every single one using city work um, asset management system daily basis. And uh, one of the reasons why we are uh, successfully maintaining the asset management system now, uh, because we provide in-house tech support and a training and a streamlined business process, including myself and uh, a couple of other GIS staff are a um, great resource to provide technical support for field crew. And uh, we also developed our own customized training manual for each group so that uh, so they just learn only what they need to know for their specific need. One of the biggest issues when we implemented an asset management system, there were there were uh, no uh, business process and documents how things need to be done. So uh, we initially met with the group to figure out the uh, current business process with a streamline, uh, streamline analysis, and it came up with a, a streamline business. And we documented the final business process and met uh, meet group on a regular basis to see if there are any changes in their uh, current business process. If they do, then uh, we update it, uh, we update it right away. So um, the last of the slide, I'd like to show uh, how we visualize the data we collect and how this will assist in decision making. We have um, created about you know, 30 different various reports that required by finance department, state, and special districts. The beauty of this report is that uh, uh, it is all dynamic. Uh, in other words, as soon as crew enter in his lo uh, labor time, material equipment will show up the report right away. So uh, let me show you one of the example of the report. Um, so let's go to uh, um, city work here. This is like a main uh, city work uh, asset management uh, page. And there's one of the report I like to show this storm sewer collection system. And then you can choose like this, and then um, let's see. Here, um, this is uh, um, one of the reports that we um, uh, generated for uh, Storm Sewer Manager called Collection System Maintenance Program. And then uh, it usually take, uh, took him uh, about the three months to uh, prepare this report but, um, because he didn't have a good system to track this activity uh, before, and uh, he was, depending on an organized legacy system and the crew's head knowledge. Since we implemented city work on this group and that this report get generated uh, generated less than a minute. So um, as you see, and he listed the uh, main task uh, and then pro uh, main task and the job that to maintain his stone sewer pipe and then track it by a quarterly basis, uh, how much progress he made. And then at the end, in the uh, end of the fiscal year, he turned it in this report to uh, Clean Water Services. Um, and uh, next slide, uh, next one, I'd like to show um, activity, uh, water activity tracking report. So let's go over um, another report. So in this report, um, you can see what is going on in water division at once. We listed it, uh, all types of uh, their work uh, tasks that they want to track, the, their activities. We divided it into uh, three categories, one for um, the active maintenance, preventive maintenance, and customer requests. So first page, we will list it every single task they want to uh, track. And then uh, each month, we track it, uh, how many assets they worked on. So this is the reactive uh, maintenance program. And the second page, you will see uh, preventive maintenance program. And then we listed every single uh, maintenance program they, they learn and then tracking uh, what they do uh, every month.
And then next one, um, I like to show what a labor cost summary. And then, uh, a water manager asks us to know the actual labor cost for uh, main task, such as uh, flush dead end and routine hydrant maintenance, uh, main breaks, customer service, and so on. So once you gather um, enough information over the years, uh, now we just started the water um, departments not long ago, so we have only a uh, year or two year um, worth of data. But once he gather enough information over the year, then he like to use this data for justification of additional um, this crew. So this is a great report to um, working with a, a director that uh, we can ask and uh, ask our help. Hey, Mike, we uh, were a bit in the question and answer time, and I had a question that may be relevant for what you're showing. Um, the question is, how does Beaverton use its AMS for planning capital improvement or rehabilitation projects, and how far in the future um, do those plans go? So uh, we uh, I'm uh, basically participating in a, um, a CIP strategic uh, committee now. So the end of the slides, I got the tool that uh, um, we made and uh, actually help help them out um, to come up with a prioritized CIP uh, project. So. Um, so we're gonna have a, a discussions about the uh, how we're gonna uh, select the uh, projects and among our group. So this uh, let me show. Um, I don't know, it's like how many minutes I have? It's like a five minutes. So why don't I jump into um, the last one here? So this is the app that like uh, um, I'm gonna show uh, you guys that we developed not long ago. So we had a uh, um, collecting massive data from um, PH, um, CCTV, and then uh, this uh, crew go out and uh, collecting all these uh, condition assessments. So one of the um, uh, information that we collect for sewer, and as you see here, you can see the uh, heat map of concentrated area for issues that we have in the sewer pipe. And then, um, so, and um, when you look at the uh, PACP score uh, layer, we have uh, two different types of layers. One is observations that we listed every single uh, issues that we capture from CCTV and has like a deposit, uh, infiltrations, and roots. And the other one, structure problem, cracking, uh, joint, those kind of problems. And then another layer, we're going to show um, the severity of uh, pipes. So let's say, um, looks like this is like a highly concentrated area for issues, um, which is Beaverton downtown area. As you zoom in, uh, it show um, total uh, number of um, um, number of cluster that has um, issues on pipe. And then let's zoom in more, and then see as you see here, in the, this this pipe has about 22 issues on this particular pipe, and a ton in red indicating that this is pretty bad conditions. And these are uh, green ones that like, uh, there's only one, a um, uh, couple of, uh, few, I mean, only a few uh, bad conditions on the pipe. So this app actually helps um, CIP engineers to identify and, uh, for their CIP project for the future. And also in this map app, like, uh, not only added, uh, we have a, a PACP score, we also added uh, materials, a ton of others. So we have a material type. So we, and also we had an age. So we listed it, um, the pipe that's uh, over uh, 40 years old. And also we have life expectancy. So that uh, showing that the pipe that is ex uh, ex uh, exceeding life ex uh, cycle. So that this is like a something, some um, something that engineers that uh, take into a, a account to be placed in pipe in the future. So, um, so this app is like a great tool um, to ask a question like, 
Which area should we focus on the next five to 10 years to improve our underground utility? So in this app, like we can turn heat map layer for all three utility layers and identify the most concentrated area instead of looking at one utility. So what I mean by this, so let's zoom back out a little bit and turn the heat map of storm and the heat map of sewer and the heat map of water. So as you see, there's some uh, concentrated area in the north uh, downtown in Beaverton area and the west part of the town and the south part of town. So you can strategically um, focus on this area so that they can come up with a better uh, long-term CIP strategic plan. So um, I skipped a little bit of slide because I had only like um, 15 minutes or 17 minutes, but uh, um, I think this end up to my slide. So um, if you have any questions, I, I, I'm i very happy to answer any question you guys have. Thank you, Mike. That was a, a great presentation and some amazing uh, visuals as well. Uh, that is all the time we have for our webinar. Any uh, unanswered questions that we have received, we will um, be able to answer by email afterwards. Uh, but I do want to thank everyone for attending and helping make this uh, a success. Uh, thank you to our presenters uh, for some really in, uh, informative uh, and uh, great the recording of the webinar and PDF versions of the presentations uh, will be available in the coming days. Uh, so again, thank you and have a great rest of your week. This concludes the webinar.